Come on, we have a panel here. This is, uh, Thank you. man, this is, what do we got? We've got Dave and Dawn. It's the D&D Connection. These guys are going to be answering all the tough questions. It's fantastic. Um, Dave and Dawn, pumped by them, been at church for a long time. We love them and thank God for them and just their friendship and their, that we, to, to know Dave and Dawn is to love them and to see. And, and what I love about this is what you see up here is what you get. Like, I, I wouldn't have people up here if they were different at home than they were at church. Or, or what you see is, is kind of what you get all the time, which is great. And they've been at church for, for a long time, and they're a part of this family uh, as a friend and a part of the family here at BC. Love how they serve. And then you got, of course, Matt and Lori, who's been a huge part. Matt's up front, uh, and he does a lot on <coughs> being head deacon. <coughs> and blessed by him and Lori and, and what they have brought to Believer's Chapel and how they minister in such a great way. And, of course, you got my bride, who we know and love dearly, Miss Renee Francis Marie Obergfeld, and just who she is to me. And this church is just is, is unstatable, really. It's incredible. So um, just a little bit. So we, we have some time. We're going to go a little longer today because of this. Hopefully we hold your attention. It'll be good. Anyways, Dave and Don, D&D, tell me about you. Like married, how long you've been married, and uh, what's, what's the one thing that you just love about your marriage? Um, we've been married for, well, it'd be 19 years and 11 months, wow. and we're getting close to 20 years now. That. And nailed that. and you know, uh, it's it's been great. What I love about our marriage is that no matter when the chips are down, we always pull together and uh, we stand as one. And that's the most important part, you know. I mean, you have bumps and bruises along the way, but you know what? I love her, and that's how life is supposed to be. What's one word? One word. One word that defines like your marriage, like for Tr- you both that you would answer that. Yeah. Trusting. Um, you have to trust each other, no matter what. You you have to be there. You have to trust each other. Um, no matter, like I said, no matter what throws, you no know, life throws along the way. As long as you guys are together, it's it's awesome. It's an awesome ride. You just have to enjoy it. Love it. Yes. Um. I'm excited we're coming up on 20 years, and um, my one word about our marriage would be uh, commitment. Um, Life throws you all sorts of curveballs. It can be health crisis. It can be job crisis. It's just the world around you is filled with all sorts of things that can give you a choice. And when you come to the crossroads, um, you either choose to pull together or pull apart. And I always want to choose to pull together with him. Yeah, Matt and Lori Cole, but believe it or not, today is our five-year anniversary of attending Believer's Chapel. Our first service was July 4th weekend five years ago, and I just realized that about 20 seconds ago. <laughs> but uh, so cool just to be part of this church. We love you guys. We love it here. We have three beautiful teenage daughters who we are blessed to be raising right here in my wife's hometown. We just moved from Colorado, like I said, about five years ago. And uh, I think one word for me when I think about our marriage, honestly, is just laughter. There's so much laughter in our marriage, and we just love, even through the bad times, we just find a way to find joy and laughter in it because you just can't take it too seriously. You really can't. And, um, and I just think laughter is something that really does define us. So we are in our 18th year of marriage, and it continues to be interesting. <laughs> we have an interesting life. That's it's right. a lot of fun. Yeah. We do laugh a lot. And... Uh, it's interesting. I said fun in the first service. For lack of a better, better word, that's what came to mind. But also, when I was thinking about it, I mean, it is fun. I have to keep up with the fun. You know, it's very, very busy fun. He's a, he's a rebel. He's a rebel. Um, I got a tattoo. I'm fun. He's a rebel. Yeah. I'm in now. But Woo. then when I was really thinking about it, you know, I think it's grace and humility is what marriage is because we all need to I know it's two words but they're two good words and um, the Bible says God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble and I think a lot of times in relationships and in marriage a lot of um, like times you just have to learn to be graceful you know and not let the proud pride bubble up, you know, because it's easy to, when you're living with each other in the same, under the same roof to become resistant, you know, sometimes, but 
in the fun, you know, it's all, it's all good. Honestly, I have a word of, that is kind of like my code uh, is loyalty. That, that's, that's what I want in life is, is a loyal family, loyal wife, loyal friends. And just when you look at marriage and you look at loyalty, that means we meant our vows. That means in sickness and health and in, in, in till death do us part, uh, we're in. And that's, there takes a sense of loyalty to that. And, and no roller coaster that just goes straight is ever a fun ride, right? A ro- life can be a roller coaster. Marriage can be ups and downs and steeps, and then you're coming back up. And that it makes for an interesting ride for sure, and it makes for a fun ride at times. But it's in the ups and downs that when you look at loyalty, um, it means something to me. And, and I want a wife who understands that, and I have a wife who gets loyalty, ups and downs, ins and outs, highs and lows, money, no money, we're moving forward. Where, where life gets gets tough, where the tragedy strikes, we're in this thing because we are loyal to one another. And uh, the team that we have at church, one, one of our codes is loyalty. And, and friends and people that we love, man, I want friends who understand that code of what it means to be loyal and stick through the thick and thin. That's a real deal for me. It's a real code for me. And I, I put that into marriage, and I love it. So is this coughing? Mm-hmm. I had some, but that's, that's down there. See that? That's good, dude. It's black, though. Come on. Okay, here we go. All right, here we go. What is, here's a question, a great question, right? Here's a great question. And it says this. It says this. How do we keep that new feeling in our marriage? How do we keep that new feeling in our marriage? Matt and Lori, you guys can take charge of that one, and we'll roll around with it. So, come on. What does it mean? New feeling. Well... I think when you're first married, everything is new, so it's supposed to be new. But as you mature in your marriage and in um, in your lives together, and as you bring children into this world, perhaps um, it's it's no longer that new, fresh feeling, but rather. I would say you're kind of redefining new as you go along because um, things change. And um, I I don't think it can ever be that same way, but you can always have a a new, fresh feeling in a different way. Right. I love the redefining new. You redefine new as you you move along. Mm -hmm. Redefine new. That's good. Come on, give me some. (laughs) Hope. That's awesome. I I love it. I mean, I love it. I love even just in looking at this marriage series and what a powerful series this has been, you know, make keeping things fresh, keeping things new. You know, we actually left a couple services ago and we got home and we were like, you know, it'd be a great idea. Let's let's remodel our bedroom. And it was so much fun and getting new colors and carpets and things like that. We just did that together. You know, it's just creating something new and something fresh. And whether that's what in a personal space of yours and something maybe you're doing together and taking new walks and things like that, just redefining new and creating new things together. So that's really special. What 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 is one thing that you do to keep it fresh? I mean, Honestly, Mary, this, this is yeah. funny. So we we laugh about this all the time. Of course, John knows and Renee knows about us. But uh, when we talk about keeping things fresh or keeping things in perspective for our perfect date night, maybe you put it like that. We love Wednesday nights. I love Wednesday nights because our kids go to breakaway. And we love breakaway for our children. But Wednesday nights in our house means this. We get to go clean pig stalls. I'm serious. We have pigs. We have horses. We have sheep. And our favorite night of the week is when we're just together. We're by ourselves. We have our muck boots on. Our kids are at breakaway having a great time. So we're at peace with that. And we're just together laughing in pig stalls, cleaning pig poop. I mean, seriously, we've been together over 20 years now. And those are the moments where we just define it as this is so much fun for us, and we laugh, and we have so much joy in that. Of course, there's special nights where we go and have a nice meal out. Of course, there's times where we go to the movie or the kids go to a babysitter, and now, of course, they babysit themselves. And those are great moments, and I encourage those moments. But sometimes it's just the fun time that you just find yourselves together doing something as hilarious as cleaning pig poop. It can be that good. That's all. I had somebody, true story, I had somebody at the end of the service said, we're going to work on our marriage. So that's great. What are you going to do? We're going to buy pigs. Buy pigs. <laughs> Seriously. It will, it will change ever. your marriage. Let's I love just leave it. it at that. I love it. <laughs> Come on, baby. What do we do to keep it fresh? Like date night, what, what do we do in, in, in redefining new? I love that. We go out to dinner. We go sit by the lake. Yes, we do. That's fun. Yes, we do. And she called me a rebel. 
I know. I've got to tell you a story. Okay, listen, my tattoo, this is a great story, because we went to lunch yesterday at Bill, Bill Lewis's overseas restaurant at, at Bemis Point called uh, The Fish. It's not an advertiser, it's just a great place, first time there for us. And uh, our waitress, she was like, I showed her my new tattoo. I just got tattoo. She's like, well, when did you get it? I said, oh, it was just yesterday. She's like, really? You got to cover that thing up, and it's going to be tender. She's like, man, you're really a rebel. Facial hair, tattoo. I'm in, babe. Rebel. <laughs> Yes, date day. you're the rebel. Date day. You're definitely the rebel. Uh, but it was kind of cute. I was just I have this picture in my mind, though, because we were at the lake and we had gone out to dinner. And but then we just sat on a bench under a tree at the lake. But there was a cute older couple and they were at a picnic table and they both were on the same side of the picnic table facing the lake. And they just had they had brought a cooler and it looked like they had takeout boxes and it was just really sweet to see an older couple just, you know, enjoying a picnic by the lake. And I think those are the things that keep your marriage, you know, yeah. fresh. I love it. What do you guys think? I think it's a connection. You have to have a connection with both of each other. Um, even if something small like getting a sub or anything like that and just spending time or see, stopping to see if you have a day off to see your wife at work or, you know, take her out to lunch and stuff like that. I just think that's important. Um, you have to make it every, every moment special just to keep that connection there. I think it is. It's about making intentional time with your spouse to reconnect. Um, the world gets so busy. Kids can make us busy work, everything gets crazy, but it could be as simple as taking a walk together. It doesn't have to be something, you know, intricately planned, although, you know, that can be good as well if, if you know, someone takes the effort to make you feel special. You know, sometimes it's about just thinking about the other person and what they would really like and what would make them feel special and valued and putting them above yourself sometimes and, you know, the, the connection is there. And honestly, you shouldn't have that new feel. It shouldn't be like your first marriage. If you're married for five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty-four 24 years, almost 20 or 20 years, you know, we, you shouldn't want that new feeling or you're not growing. Marriage is, is this ever-growing, maturing relationship that we want to be better at 70. And how is it that we become better at 70? Because at 70, you don't want to be like that new at, at you know, 21, 22, or whenever you, you're getting married you want to grow and there is maturity and there is challenges and all of that. I don't want to go back to the first year we were married. Like we've been married for 24 years. Now we can sincerely say it really does get better every year. And how do you, how do you define that? Like, why would I want to go back to, well, we're missing that new feeling. Well, redefine new because it's always changing. We're always growing and there's new challenges and there's new joys and there's new laughter in all of that. So Matt, like, Larry, how do, you, how do you guys look at what it means to be better at 70? Yeah, I mean, honestly, as I think about that, you know, being better at 70, it's an important thing to consider. But I just look at just the last 20 years and what a blessing it is to look at our marriage in the last 20 years and look at where we were when we first got married and look at the life we lived and look at where we are now and just see the miraculous gift that God gives us through marriage because every single day is better. You know, I look at the way we laugh together now. I look at the way we get through hard times together now. I look at the way we parent together now, our alone time together now. And it's so much better than it was even a month ago, even a year ago. And I just love that as God's plan, God's design for marriage is to get better if you do it his way. And as you just grow in your strength and your trust with one another, um, man, it's just it's such a blessing. So I look forward to those years. You know, I look forward to the next 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 and 25 and 30 years to get to that place to then look back and just say, what an amazing journey that's been to only get better as marriage grows. You know, I was thinking about that because, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty close to a correlation that you want to move forward as, you know, as slowly as possible because 70 is creeping up pretty quick. So you should live. for you. I know. <laughs> anyway. Um, Shh. Anyhow, moving, moving forward and stuff, I mean, you, you want to savor every year up to 70 because it's going to be exciting at 70, but you want to also not lose what you have now. Um, there's been so many trials and tribulations through our life that I look back at it and I'm like, he paved the way to what we're, where, where we're at now, and each year is going to get better up to 70, and it's just going to be way better at 70, you know? You just have to live... You, Live your every day like it's your last because you are together and you are together as one. 
and that's just how you should be. Um, I find that our marriage has been constantly evolving, and um, this year we became empty nesters, and so it was, you know, a, a new experience for us having a quiet house because we have a swimmer, and swimmers never travel alone. They sw travel in packs, so we always had a house filled with kids, um, and so we've had to learn how to reconnect on so many different levels um, and, and to be a couple, and, you know, it's it's... A whole new experience uh, but to be better at 70 I think now we're kind of exploring who we are and things we like to do and trying new things together um, constantly evolving and growing uh, you know towards the future because before our lives were about the kids and it's it you get caught up in all of the kids activities and different things going on and you know at 70 you really can have that time to to really enjoy each other you know and hopefully even beyond that to think about being better at 70, I think about um, tune-ups along the way and, and really investing in realigning, realigning our marriages. And um, nobody wants to get a realignment on their car. They're like 120 bucks or something. Nobody wants to do that, but it's important. And I think we can do the same thing in our marriages um, to just spend the time uh, every now and again to, to realign our, our values and our interests and just... Um, to, to keep it, it interesting and to keep the spark there. So I think investing in realignments is a key to being better at 70. Amen. Right. All right, here's one. Here's a good question. Let me get it out. Here it says, it says, should couples each do their own devotions and then also do devotions together and how often? Yes, couples should do devotions together and they should do them often. Right. And... Okay. Um, Sean usually wakes up pretty early in the morning and does his devotion, and then I'll wake up and I... You get up about noon. No, that's not true. But anyway. Um, so I do um, love when, you know, I can ask Sean, you know, what did you get from your devotion this morning? And... I, I love to say, wash me with the water of the word. I want to, what was your revelation? What, what did God show you today? And, you know, just that newness of every morning with a cup of coffee. It's fun. And um, it's just, it's great for couples to be in the word of God together and just searching out God's promises and, and what God has for us um, you know, as a couple and praying together and praying over our children and, you know, praying over your day for protection. We always, you know, pray for the angels to watch over our children. We ask the Lord to cover him, cover our children with his precious blood and let no weapon formed against them prosper. And we do that every day, whether we do it together or separate, but we do pray that every day. And even sometimes we lay hands on our children before they go out the door and pray over them. And, you know, it's just uh, that precious time in the morning. Yeah. What do you guys think on that? Praying together and personal time? And... I, th I think praying together is important. Um, I think it's a time where you can be at your most vulnerable. And so it's a time where you really have a chance to grow closer to both God and to your spouse or your children or whoever you're praying with. Um, and so doing it together really helps you, you know, in that matter. Um, I think that, you know, you also should have some time by yourself where you're doing your devotions because sometimes sometimes you have to look inward to, to really grow in your faith. So I think that they can complement each other, you know, but I think it's they're both important. Yeah, we talked about this uh, in the first service, and I know Sean mentioned, obviously, passing of Charlene this week. Her services were here on Wednesday, such, and as he mentioned, such a great turnout from the home group. But I spoke with Art this morning, and I said something that struck me so powerful as, as Art was just speaking about just even their last few months together, something that they had just started doing. Now, this is a couple in their 70s. And he said, we'd wake up every morning, we'd sit at a coffee table, and we'd reach across the table with our coffee, and we'd just hold hands. And we'd just watch the sun come up, and we'd pray over each other. And honestly, just sitting in the back of the church on Wednesday morning, that really struck with me. You know, I know we, we do come together at Seek, and we pray, and it's a powerful time. 
But as we really just consider what that looks like, yes, time of devotional and just doing our own time is great. But what a powerful statement just to know that they made that decision in their 70s to start doing that, that it's never too late. And to start praying with one another and over one another is such a powerful, powerful thing that we can all do. And uh, it personally, that struck with me. That did. And even like the personal time is so important. That should be daily. But even for Renee and I, I mean, we are busy people and everyone is busy and has a schedule. And we probably hit devotions fully together probably four times a week. And, and it's not like an every single day thing, seven days a week, here's our regimented time and we got to do it or we'll fall apart. It's, it's that personal time that is so valuable every day. And then it is coming together probably four times a week. We really do open the scripture and we get into the devotion and we do it as a family as well and just laying hands on each other. And what we, uh, when, when the whole family is together, one of our customs are, one of our deals is, is when it's time to pray, Everybody prays to the person to your left. So you're praying for this person. So the whole family hears one another praying for one another. There's power in that. And it takes time, though. You can't, it's not a three-minute deal. You know, you set time aside, and uh, you begin to pray for one another. You just pray for the person to your left. And whatever's coming up in their world, and, and like Don said, man, it connects you. And there's a moments in, in times of prayer that, that are wonderful. So um, here's a good question. Here it is. I love this. Is it ever acceptable to take another side against our spouse? Is it, other, is it ever acceptable to take another side against our spouse? We'll start with you guys. What do you guys say? So my answer to that is not publicly ever. Um, you're a team. Uh, you sign up to have each other's back. Uh, you're, nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes. And, you know, if you, if you see your spouse is making a mistake or doing something that kind of goes against, you know, your values, you, you talk about it in private. You, you publicly have their back. You never talk badly about your spouse in public to others because it, there's nothing good that can ever come of that. Um, basically, you should build each other up. Um, and if people, you know, hear you building your spouse up, it just creates a different climate of respect. And, you know, it, it makes people want to be better, want to be more positive, I think. So. I think it's important um, that you do it at home. You don't do it amongst people because not only does it draw out negativity, but other people will start, you know, maybe having negative influences somewhere else. And I just... You just got to keep it at home. I, you know, just like your devotions and stuff. And you get closer at home, and when you're closer and you build each other up outside, you just kind of want to do that. You know, sometimes things just don't go your way. Checks and balances, you know. Don't do it in the public. Do it at home. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, um, I think just because you're married doesn't mean that you always have to agree. Um, many times that we come together in our marriages, but we have different ideas about something. And that doesn't mean somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Um, but I agree with Don and Dave that if you do have a disagreement on something, I'm not quite sure what that question was about. Uh, I don't know how deep it was, but um, that you do take it back to a private setting. Yeah, I would agree. Um, obviously, unless it involves not getting your wife a soda before a movie. I mean, because that's, that's big. I mean, that's like way up here. I mean, that, that you can talk about in public. You can bring that out in the open. Can't be late. We had a great time with that question because we had to watch it online last week because we were away for, with family. But uh, we watched the service. And, of course, at the end, as you guys may remember, when we were talking about Sean and going to the movies and Renee wanting to get a soda, we pushed pause. And Lori goes, I can't believe he didn't stop and get her a soda. <laughs> And I go, babe, you can't be late for a movie. Like, what if the movie's packed? And she goes, we live in Olean, you know? It was just, it was we, we just had a great moment with it. it. But, but in seriousness, we, we represent each other 24-7. Sean just made a, a great reference to that, and, and, and obviously the series, that 24-7. And in public, when you're always lifting up your spouse, always lifting up your spouse. And if there are disagreements, which there will always certainly be, just handling those with grace and kindness, but in the presence of one another, and uh, always be encouraging in public about your spouse, because we should be. We're all blessed. And that, there, there was another question, which I won't read it verbatim, but there was a question in regards to my husband loves to come to church and worship 
but yet outside of church, he, he uses foul language uh, and speaks inappropriately about me as a wife. Um, how, do you, how do you address this issue? That was one of the questions. And um, I think Matt just really touched on that in regards to what it means to really, you're married 24-7. And, you know, what does it look like in, in Proverbs 12, verse 4, it says, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, which means uh, crown here, it's a word that, that symbolizes victory. And, and an excellent wife is the victory or the celebration of her husband. Do you just celebrate on church on a Sunday morning and worship and love God and then talk like the boys and act like the boys? And if you work in a public place, I mean, I worked in the police force for many years, and you hear men talk about, the old lady at home. You hear men disrespect their wives, and it's just, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. Don't be the one. Be the one who celebrates your wife in her presence and outside of her presence. Be the one who you actually have bought into the truth that she is my victory. She's my celebration. Now, if I go to your workplace and ask the guys, how does uh, her husband celebrate her? And they would just begin to laugh, going, what are you talking about? I don't even think they love one another. Like, what is the real deal in regards to what we say? What do you guys think about that? I think that when you brought that up, I was thinking to myself, if you are going to work or any place outside of work or, you know, even at home, and if you don't treat each other the same, like if you treat your wife that way or she treats you that way, I think it's a direct you're together, you're one flesh. So you're treating yourself bad because she's part of you. And I think that way, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're, you're one as a whole, you know? If you're gonna treat one person badly, it's gonna look bad on, upon yourself because you're not treating her with respect. Yeah, I, I just think it's all about respect. Um, I think outside of the home, you know, uh, you, you should build your wife up. You should, you know, things aren't always perfect, but everybody has so many good things about them. So if you are going to talk about your spouse or your children, you know, focus on the good things, focus on the ways they shine and you can change the climate because, um, I, I know all of us at one point or another have been in an environment that's toxic where everybody is negative and things are drawing you down and Sometimes it just takes one person behaving differently to change the climate. And so if you start building up, I just feel like people are inherently good. And so if you try to change that around and make things more positive, I feel like it encourages people to want to be better, to want to do better just inside themselves. And, and changing that climate and making it more positive is, is never a bad thing. It's always, always a good thing. Um, especially when it relates to your family and your spouse. I mean, you should be proud of them. You should be, you know, celebrating their victories. And, you know, it just makes for, for a much happier life, I guess. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. I think we need to remember that when we leave this room on a Sunday, that we are part of a body of believers. And church isn't just here in, uh, in these four walls. It's outside. You are the church. And uh, we need to remember that in the presence of non-believers or uh, friends or buddies who might be speaking um, poorly about other people, there's nothing more attractive than a person who lifts up their spouse. And uh, I, th I think that I'm not sure how, how to respond to this, this, this woman who per is perhaps going through this other than to just really reiterate that to her husband that, it's really attractive, and, and, and the guys that you're hanging out with will see something different in you when you stop doing what they do. When you start lifting me up or lifting people up, they'll see that person that perhaps they want to be too, so you can set an example. Here's, here's a question, and this is, this is, as we talked last night, and you guys are open about this in regards to how... how can you address or touch upon blended families? Because it really is just a such, uh, such a thing for families coming together with stepchildren and children. And, and what does that look like in the church? And, and how, do you, how do you function that way on touching on blended families? So Dave and I um, are actually a blended family. I was married before, and I have a son. 
And uh, I, Dave and I actually were friends for quite a while, you know, several years before we ever actually even dated. Um, it, it, was, it was hard being a single mom, um, but the reason that he stole my heart is um, I, I can pinpoint it to a specific time and event. Um, my son was playing t-ball on a team, and the coach uh, for the t-ball team was really sick and was out for illness, so there was no coach. So he went for a couple of weeks with pra without practice, and Dave said, I'll coach the team. And at this point, we weren't even dating. He was single and young, and I, I said, I said, are you? I'm like, are you sure you know what you're signing up for? We're talking five and six year olds running around like maniacs, you know? And he said, no, I'll do it. And he was great. And he and my son actually started to build a bond and it stole my heart. So um, I, I guess the key with blended families is if you're thinking, you know, if you're a single parent and you're thinking of getting into a relationship, I think it's really important to, uh, to really look at the person that you're getting involved with. Um, what you're looking for is you're looking for someone who will love your children the same way that you do. Um, you know, anything less is just something that you, you need to run um, because, you know, this person's gonna become a role model and a, a mentor to your children. Um, it, it's also hard in the beginning, uh, you know, because once, once we dated and we got married, um, I, I, he became a father figure to my son. And so I wanted someone my son could look up to. And, um, you know, you would, people say this all the time, you would never know that he's not Eddie's biological father. They're, they, as he's grown up into an adult, they're like best friends. And, um, he, he's amazing, and so that's what you want to look for. Um, if, you, if you don't settle for anything less, you want, you want that love, and you want someone who's upstanding that your kids can look up to. The secret um, be, behind Eddie and I is I love him just like he's my own, and that's the secret, because I would do anything for him, and that's part of my life. My kids are my life, and my wife's my life, and God, and that's how it is. And that, and that and that works because she's allowed a transfer to take place. So many times in the blended family, well, you're not allowed to correct my kids. And the wife, the wife can't tell the husband, you're not allowed to correct my kids. Because there has to be a biblical transfer there for authority to take place in the home. And it's successful because they've done it. All right, I want to talk to singles a little bit. You're single here. We've got some thoughts on, on, on single. And, and Renee, I want you to answer this one in regards to And we'll go around and we'll talk about this because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question on what is what is our advice to being dateable like if you're single what is your advice to someone who's single and what what is your advice on being dateable like if you're looking to be in a relationship one day what's your advice on being dateable um i was you know definitely attracted to sean because of his godly character and he didn't have a tattoo back then, so it wasn't that. Um, but he was um, just an encourager. You know, I knew that he loved the Lord, and I was newly saved when I met him. And I, you know, really just, you know, fell in love with his heart for God and um, just how, you know, he was um, just a man of character, you know. Um, he didn't have a foul mouth. He didn't, you know, ever say anything that would be, you know, offensive or, you know, chauvinistic. You know, it was just like he, he the love of God just poured out of him. And um, one of the things that I came across was the word submission and... Uh, that word can come with kind of a bad connotation. You know, women don't like that word, but um, I heard it said that submission means to, sub is a word, it means come under, and then mission. So submission, like it's, uh, you know, us coming under 
our, our man's mission, you know? And so I like to encourage single women to find a man who actually has a mission and that mission should be bringing God's kingdom to earth and seeing men, women, and children come to Christ and um, just being in union with somebody who has the same, you know, love for the Lord as you do and someone who um, helps you to be stronger and to um, just, you know, be that light in the world. And so. That's great. That's game man. Give me some love. Whoop. What do you guys say? I'm like, what would you say for, what, what advice would you give on being dateable? Yeah, I mean, honestly, first of all, don't look at the world's view on being single. Embrace being single. And I know we're talking to a lot of different age demographics here, but embrace being single. It's a gift. It's a great time in life to just be, get to know yourself. Obviously, grow in your relationship with Christ. Identify yourself. You know, when you think about what you want somebody to be attracted to you by, you want them to be attracted to you because you love yourself, you know, and you love who you are. And to do that, that's just growing in the time that you have with yourself. Because once you're married, you're married for life. You're married 24-7 for the rest of your life till death do you part. That's a fact. And so just in really embracing the time where you're single and you're getting to develop in yourself and to getting to develop, again, your relationship with Christ and identifying who you are, that's what people are going to be attracted to. You know, I think, I think of the young men. You know, I, the, the weavers come to mind. Actually, Carter Overfell, he comes to mind. Just loving to work, not being afraid to put their hand to a plow. And as a young lady, knowing that, man, that, that guy is going to, he's going to really work hard for us as a family. You know, when, we're, when we do have children, if God blesses us with children, he's going to work hard for our family. And so even speaking to the men, you know, being a hard worker is something that's very attractive, you know, and just really being appreciative, again, of who you are and identifying yourself with you and what you love to do. I would say I see a lot of women, especially young women, uh, looking for that spouse when they're single instead of embracing the time that they have and the time that God has given them to be single because it is their season. I feel like they're always, they're looking forward to the next season and, and forgetting to enjoy the season that they're in. So I would just encourage singles to en enjoy the season that you're in and continue to focus on being the best you because it's, it will ultimately be God's timing for when you find your, your mate and they'll be attracted to that person who, who you've become. I think the most important thing is, like Matt said, to love yourself, but you don't want to settle either. You, you just, you want to move forward. You want to, you know, get everything you have to get away, you know, get out of life and just move along because he's going to send you somebody that's special. He's going to send you somebody that's going to build you up and it's going to be, want, they're going to want to be with you. You just don't want to settle in life and, you know, just... Just say, well, this is all I got. But it's not you because you're letting yourself down. So love yourself. Uh, building on that, I think that your single time, um, you should focus on becoming the best version of you that you can. Because once you merge in a marriage, you're, you're a partnership. And so it's two of you, you know, leading and going through life together. When you're single, you have a chance to decide who you are and what your values are, um, what you want in life, which direction you're heading. And I think that if you don't take that time while you're single to, to really become firmly established in your faith and in who you are and your values, you know, you may end up with the wrong person. So I, I think that that's your time. Um, build, build, yourself up to become the best partner that you can because when you go into a relationship you want to bring something wonderful to the table you want you want to find a, a partner that that you can go through life and you want to have something to offer them so you know work on yourself I just I just think that being dateable is being careful and choosing wisely like don't go into a quick decision and of course, as Christians, we, we want to marry somebody who, who loves Jesus and has the same faith and walk in that sense to like our priority, even before uh, your husband or your wife ever showed up and even after they will ever show up, it is Christ first. 
So you, you had Adam and Eve in the garden. You had God in the garden. God is the equation to husband and wife. And being, being single and being dateable, it's always the Lord first in my life. And he's the one who works on my heart. He's the one who is, who is creating this desire in me. And, and first priority is Jesus. And let me just caution you on this. Just because you have two people who love Jesus doesn't mean, well, they're, they're dateable. I can marry him just because he's a Christian. Well, that's, that, I know two Christians, I know Christians who love one another or are married, but they don't like one another. Like they're just, they're both Christians. They love Jesus, but they hate marriage because they just either went into it way too fast or they didn't really know one another or they went into a place going, the, the bottom line is, well, he's saved, so everything's going to be okay. Well, that's just necessarily not the truth. You want to get to know one another, spend time with one another, really know the values of one another. And just, just because someone's a Christian, it doesn't mean they're an automatic candidate for husband or wife. You need to be very careful on that. They have to be a Christian to get married. If, if, it's, if you're a believer, they need to be a believer. According to Scripture, you really should marry someone of the same faith because it is our direction because it's always Jesus first. But let me just caution you if you're single, uh, don't jump at the first Christian you know and say, oh, God's brought us together. You need to be very careful on that and make sure that you're walking in a way of taking your time, walking in a mature way, really beginning to know one another. Know, I love what Renee said, know the mission of your man so you can put yourself under that mission. And I just, that's, that's fantastic, man. I love that. I love that in, in that sense. Um, any other thoughts on that? Because that's, that's fantastic. We're going to close out in two minutes. But um, in, in regards to, I think, a great thing in relationship is just what it means to really keep it simple and what it means to really lighten up and know we're going to go through ups and downs and there's going to be times and the enemy hates us and he's going to try to get us off rail and he's going to try to get us off alignment to bring it back into alignment and make the clicks that are necessary. But keep it lighthearted and keep it simple and laugh as much as you can laugh. Laughter does the heart like medicine. It's, it's a true God-given gift to really look at stupid and laugh at it and look at tragedy in a sense of we're going to get through this and we're going to see the joy of the Lord even continue to sustain us, even in hurt and brokenness, but we're going to do it, we're going to do it together, right? What's your thoughts, babe? Yes, we do it together, and I believe that iron sharpens iron, and two are better than one because the Bible says we have a better return for our labor, and we just encourage and strengthen one another in our walk. We're a team. We work together. We're running a race. We're running the race where we want to be, you know, victorious in the end. And um, we know the Bible says that Christ is coming for his bride. And so working together in marriage is such a blessing and a gift because we're able to help one another out in this journey. And um, we want to be that that bride that's ready and free and clean and without blemish when Christ return. And what better way to, you know, work towards that goal than to have someone that you're so close with and who knows your every, you know, everything about you and, um, you know, just being serving one another and helping one another. And we just got to touch on this real quick. Cause I think one of the dangers can be in relationship is when you get in a group of people, and, and the statement comes out, and this can be so dangerous, is why can't you be like him? Or why can't you be like her? Or why can't we be like, did you see? They're so happy on Facebook, and did you see all? Listen, you guys, we need to touch on this just for a minute, and we got to roll. But there is, there is the comparison game that's, and, and that social media has presented that is, that is a false front. People only put their best on there. And people who need attention, they post the most because they need the attention. And, and when you come to a place to know, man, that person really needs a lot of attention because they certainly post about themselves a lot. And they present this picture that is so perfect and wonderful. And you can see us six up here and, and transparent and honest. Listen, we, we all have our struggles and we all have worked through our mountains and our hills and our valleys. And just God's done a great work in all of us. But don't compare don't go in and dare say, man, why can't you be like him? Well, he's got issues. And the fence isn't always greener. The grass isn't always greener on the other side of the fence. So be so careful on that. God, has, God can bless your marriage. And God can make the two of you something that's wonderful and beautiful without trying to compare to someone else. I think that's so dangerous. Matt, close it out on that. What do you think, man? Yeah, I, I do. It's, a, it's an amazing thing to think about. You know, the enemy is certainly crouching at your door. 
I don't care if it's your bedroom door. I don't care if it's your bathroom door. I don't care if it's your kitchen. I don't care if it's your front door, your barn door. It doesn't matter. He's always crouching at your door. And you have to, as a couple, you have to remind each other of that. We often find ourselves in those conflicts with life where we come together on things. And I'm seeing her struggling with something that happened outside of the house. And we bring her in. And, and, and we talk about that. We talk about the enemy's plan. And he hates marriage. But yet that grows us together. We get stronger in that and knowing that we're in a battle, but we're in a battle together. And I love that. And uh, we didn't do this first service, guys, but I do want to just take a moment. Um, as you guys know, Sean and Renee put so much time into the marriage series. And I just want to recognize these last five weeks as so important for the church. I know Sean and Renee are already looking forward to next year's marriage service, service and how they can even continue to grow on those things. But seriously, as a church, we're so blessed to be in the presence, to have a pastor who leads us in a way, who truly preaches marriage from the Bible, who's not afraid to put it out there. And even if those things may hurt, take those hurts, take those little zingers, and take those and grow from them. But I just, just can we just give Sean and Ray a, just a big thank you for what they have done? Amen. Hey, come on, let's just pray. And just uh, please don't forget, seek tonight. And Renee and I love what we do. We're so honored to be in this place, truly and the team that we have, and just, um, it's just really good. It's just really good right now, and we're so blessed, and we're so excited about what's ahead. But I'm excited because I want your marriage good. Honestly, that's our heart, is that your marriage is right with God, and that you're in a home that's full of life, and you're in a home that your conversations are more full of life than they are of death. And that you're in a home and a marriage that you, you love to be with one another. And you, you come to the, the reality is we are better together. That's who we are. We're better together. And we're going to live in a way that is right with one another. That's what we want for your marriage because it is bigger than you. And it reflects Christ in the church. You represent something that's bigger than you are. And when you come to that place to realize, man, we're in this thing. And we're in it together. And we're better together. And we're going to walk a line in marriage and I hope and pray, I believe, that God has done something in this, in this marriage series in your life and in your relationship. And it just it takes work, and it takes uh, just continue to pattern day after day. But let's just pray. And I know we're way late, but I just appreciate your time. First time we've done the BC Roundtable, and, and, and I'm just so glad that you're here. And I love the panel and what God's doing in all of our lives up here. And we're just uh, we're so thankful. Seek is tonight. Come out as a husband and wife. Come out, you who are single. I hope that this marriage series blessed you as being single, just getting targeted and being, being understanding what it looks like for your future and just standing strong in your ground and uh, maintaining your innocence in that way. So, Lord, we just thank you for uh, just what you've done for marriage. God, how you've created it. Father, I pray that you bless us as we go. Thank you for the close of this uh, marriage series, even tonight as we close it out at Seek and just praying. And just believing that your word is true and it's alive and it's powerful. And as we put it into action, God, it comes through us in a real mighty way. In a mighty way, God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen church. Come on. Yeah.